Good evening. Can you hear me? So so? Can you make me taller? Okay. I'm Ellen Levy, chair of the Great Decisions Committee and a board member of the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan. Welcome to the lead program of our yearly Great Decisions Foreign Policy Series, our largest, most prestigious lecture and discussion series. We have an excellent lineup for you again this year, and we've returned to tradition with beginning the series tonight with a national public radio speaker. But before we begin our program this evening, please allow me to run through a couple of details. We'd like to thank our evening sponsors, Booking.com and Grand Rapids Community College. Thank you. And we would also like to thank Michigan Radio, our media sponsor for the Great Decision Series for the past 15 years. This has been a natural partnership as the Council and Michigan Radio are both committed to providing Michigan with information on foreign policy issues. Thank you very much, Michigan Radio. And we're always interested to know the demographic of our audience. So how many of you are students taking the great decisions tonight? Over there. Great. And how many of you are members of the council? Yay, fabulous. If you're not a World Affairs Council member, you may join us for as little as $10 a year with our email membership. If you join after the program this evening, your membership will only be $5 because we'll give you a $5 credit towards, electric, uh, towards your ticket costs this evening. And the rest of your Great Decisions programs will only be $10 a ticket. So to purchase your new membership, please stop by the table in the lobby after the lecture. We're also selling Great Decisions textbooks. You'll find them very interesting. They're also out there for $20. And please remember to fill out your ballot. You should ha each one of you should have been given one as you came into the auditorium. At the end of the Great Decisions Program, the Foreign Policy Association reports the results of ballots collected th from throughout the country uh, to the White House. For those of you who regularly voted in last year's Great Decisions balloting, we have a few ballot reports available in the lobby. Given the very well-received armchair discussion format from last year, we will repeat the same performance this year. Many of you will remember the speaker presents for about 20 to 25 minutes, highlighting the main themes of the topic, and then the moderator will ask several follow-up questions. This leaves plenty of time for the audience to ask your questions, so please prepare questions throughout the talk this evening. And don't be shy, we have microphones um, on either side of the podium. Please come down to the microphones in these two open spaces. You don't need to kneel or, or sit. Uh, you won't be blocking anybody's view. So on to tonight's program. Our speaker this evening is Dina Temple Rastin, counterterrorism correspondent for NPR. Right, NPR. Ms. Temple Rastin has written books on issues of national security, and she has filed many stories for NPR covering counterterrorism. Tonight, she will help us think through the wide-ranging threats um, that face us in a time when defense budgets are narrowing. Please join me in welcoming Dina Temple Rastin for her presentation the new threat assessment, defending America on a budget. Hi there, I'm Dina Temple Raston, and uh, it's, I always have mixed feelings when I meet audiences because you've known me as a uh, disembodied voice for a while, and uh, uh, it kind of takes all the mystery out of it to actually see what I look like and see the voice coming out of my mouth. But I understand a little bit of what you're feeling because um, Susan Stamberg works in the Washington office. I'm out of New York usually. But whenever I'm in the Washington office, I try and time my coffee breaks for when she's in the kitchen so that I can actually see the voice coming out of her body. I think it's, uh, um, I'm a big Susan Stamberg fan. So what I thought I would do is we have a nice mix of the audience. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Great Decisions textbook, but I'm also gonna talk in a broader sense of the things that I think uh, are kind of missing from it from a counterterrorism perspective. And then I'm going to bring it back around again to this idea of, of budgets. Um, the Great Decisions uh, textbook uh, assesses threats and ranks terrorism somewhere between inconvenient and serious. And, and I think that's about right. 
But what I thought I would do is give you a little more to think about uh, when it comes to threats and to talk about some things I think you should be thinking about just uh, over the next sort of six to nine months, things that I think are going to start appearing in the papers. I think sort of my responsibility when I do one of these speeches is to kind of put you ahead of the curve and give you an idea of what we're thinking about at NPR to put you ahead of the curve as listeners. But since you showed up in the snow, you get to find out before 31 million people who listen to the radio do. Okay. So basically, uh, I think that the threat assessment uh, chapter in this uh, Great Decisions book should have also included the role of drones. Drones in uh, eliminating threats and drones as possibly causing threats. Um, I also thought that it should have uh, included the intersection of terrorism and transnational crime. Um, and I'll give some examples of that and why I think this is going to be sort of the next wave of terrorism. And then I wanted to give you a little slightly different lens through which to maybe view the Arab Spring or the Arab Uprising, um, a, a terrorism lens. And, uh, and after I do all that, then I'll, I'll sit down uh, with Vince Duffy and he'll grill me on all of that. So um, I just got back from uh, about five weeks in Pakistan and uh, there was real confusion about the way Pakistanis feel about drones. When, when we hear about this, we hear that Pakistanis hate the drones and it's, it's driving the Pakistanis uh, against us. In fact, the people who really hate drones in Pakistan are the Pakistan elite the people that people like me talk to because they speak English and they're accessible. So one of the big things I wanted to do while I was in Pakistan, basically NPR sent me there to run the Islamabad Bureau for about five weeks. And what I wanted to do when I was there was actually go to a drone site. As you may not realize this, but there actually have not been English-speaking journalists who have actually gone to a drone site in Pakistan and asked the people who were around that drone site how they feel about the drone program. So um, I had a really great source who was a very high-ranking official in the ISI, which is the Pakistani equivalent of the CIA. And I explained to him that there was this confusion in the United States about the drone program in Pakistan, and that I wanted to go to a drone site. And we had this all set up, except that there was one little hitch, and that was that the Americans couldn't guarantee that wherever I was, they wouldn't shoot while I was there. So I decided not to go. Um, and, and that's how pervasive the drone program is in North and South Waziristan in Pakistan today. I mean, they're running all the time. But what my understanding is, is that the regular Pakistanis who are living day to day with the Taliban in these areas actually are not so against the drone program because they're the ones who are having to deal with the Taliban's day to day decrees, uh, the Sharia law in which women have to be covered, where there's no music, those sorts of things. And, and since the drone program has started, they will tell you that militants have abandoned a lot of these areas. So it is working. And people who study radicalization in Pakistan say the radicalization of young men in these areas has also gone way down because basically these militants have had to go to ground. What nobody talks about, and this is uh, the story I really want to do for uh, NPR, is what nobody talks about is uh, this other problem with drones, which is that they have a hum. And this hum is a pervasive hum that they hear over North and South Waziristan 24 hours a day. But here's the difference about the hum. The hum is often followed by an explosion. So if you hear the hum, you've got to be sort of bracing yourself for an explosion. So let's see if this microphone, does this microphone still work if I'm not behind that? Okay. So. I was in Iraq for NPR in 2008. And uh, one of the things that, uh, is that way too loud now? Okay, so uh, one of the things that uh, I experienced while I was there was mortars, which I had never really experienced before. And um, mortars, I don't know why, but I thought they were like a gun, like they go in you know, rounds of six or something. And in fact, rotor, mortars are incredibly unpredictable. And they ironically sound exactly like the beginning of Saving Private Ryan. That whole sort of scenes where, where they're hitting the beach, mortars really sound like that. And they sound a little bit like thunder. So weirdly, if you've grown up um, uh, looking at lightning and then listening for thunder, you end up doing that when you have mortars. Now, I, I'm sure there's some people who are uh, serving the military who are here and have experienced some of this. Um, but also what I found is we lived in the red zone. There's a green zone in, in, in Iraq, and then there's a red zone. The green zone was where, behind blast walls, was where the embassy was, 
where um, most of the um, functions of government and the governmental build buildings for the Iraqis, like the Department of Justice, was behind these blast walls. And uh, we lived in the red zone because we wanted to be close to the Iraqis and ask the Iraqis what were going on. We didn't want to be in this sort of bubble of the green zone. So mortar attacks happened a lot. I was there in the spring of 2008, so I was there for the assault on Basra and the assault on Sadr City, which were pretty heavy times in Iraq. And uh, so there was a lot of mortar fire there. And when a mortar lands close to you, at least this is the way it worked in our house, um, it actually sucks the air out of the room. And uh, when you've had a lot of mortars fall, you'll be sleeping, and then you'll suddenly wake up, and you can't breathe. And you're not sure if it's because you dreamed a mortar or if one actually fell. But I can tell you what does happen is that you stay up and wait for another mortar to fall so you can figure out whether or not you dreamed the mortar or one actually fell. The reason why I tell you this story is because it gives me, I think, a little bit of insight about what it must be like to have drones buzzing overhead all the time. Because you think you hear it, but you're not sure you hear it, and uh, you wonder if there's going to be an explosion that follows soon. So one of the things that they're finding in these areas of Pakistan where the f drones have been flying a lot is they have found that these people are suffering from PTSD. So when you talk about Pakistanis and the way they feel about the drone program, I think we're maybe seeing it in the wrong context. Uh, it's not whether they do or don't like drones. It's sort of these ancillary effects that the drone program is having. And I'm not quite sure how you, how you fix that unless you have a non-humming drone. Um, the, the second thing I wanted to talk about has to do with the, uh, the intersection of terrorism and transnational crime. Now, I've been working on al-Qaeda-like things since 2004. I wrote a book about the Lackawanna Six, who were those guys in upstate New York who attended an al-Qaeda camp just before 9-11. And uh, in order to write that book, I had to travel to Yemen and go to the villages they were from. I went to Pakistan and stayed in jihadi hotels where they stayed. That was a little freaky. Uh, and then I uh, basically went up to the border and went across the border into Afghanistan on the back of a motorcycle because that's what they did and I thought to have street cred, I'd have to do that too. And then I scurried back across the border and got them to stamp my passport because I didn't want to be arrested for sneaking into Afghanistan. This was in 2005 and it seemed like um, everywhere I went, something happened like a week after I left. So if the FBI was monitoring me very carefully, it looked like I was setting timers everywhere. Uh, because there'd be like a suicide bombing as soon as I left Karachi, or there would be sort of a, a, the first of the suicide bombings at the time, or there would be some mishap uh, you know, at the border where I just was at Spin Boldick. Uh, so Al-Qaeda used to be Al-Qaeda core. We all know about that, right? And then it changed and morphed a little bit and became Al-Qaeda with affiliates. Here in Michigan, I know that you guys are, are intimately aware of the Abdul Muttalib case, the underwear bomber case. Uh, and I think Andy Arena has, for the, from the FBI has come and sp spoken to you before. He's a, really an amazing guy and interviewed Abdul Muttalib himself. Um, so he was with an affiliate. So it wasn't Al-Qaeda Corps that ordered that attack uh, on Northwest Flight 253. It was an affiliate. So that was the second sort of generation of Al-Qaeda. And, and now what we're seeing is, and what I think we're going to see over the next couple of years, is what happened with the BP plant. Now, my editor for some time has been talking about the intersection of terrorism and uh, uh, transnational crime. And for no good reason, uh, transnational crime for some reason makes my eyes glaze over. I'm not quite sure what it means. And it's sort of one of these buzzwords that sounds very sexy, but it's hard to sort of nail something onto it. I mean, I think of drugs, I think of you know, human trafficking, but I'm not quite sure what I think transnational crime is. But the BP uh, uh, facility attack really crystallized this for me. Um, there is a group uh, in Al-Qaeda, one of its affiliates, not the one in Yemen that sent the bomber, but actually the group Al-Qaeda in the Arabian, uh, sorry, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, AQIM. And AQIM was sort of the black sheep of the affiliates. And it was the black sheep of the affiliates because really it was all about crime. AQIM made its name by kidnapping Westerners and getting tens and later hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, by returning Westerners safely. Uh, and gathering these ransoms. One of the top guys in AQIM was a guy named Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar. And Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar, his name may be familiar to you now because he thought out the BP plan. He was the one who thought of, of, of attacking the BP plant. 
Um, but what Mukhtar, Bel Mukhtar was always so famous for is he's the most famous smuggler in the Sahel. Okay, the Sahel, I've never understood what that really meant either, but I finally had someone explain to me what the Sahel region is. It's basically a big band at the top of North Africa, and it was a trading region. Okay, so, so S-A-H-E-L, no, Sahel. Okay, so, the, so he was the greatest smuggler in the Sahel. So here's a guy who's a great kidnapper, a great smuggler, who used to get letters from Osama bin Laden that said, hey, knock off the kidnapping and the smuggling. We're supposed to be sort of an ideologically pure organization here. And you're using the Al-Qaeda name, uh, but you're basically a common criminal. And Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar kept doing these crimes. Now what a lot of people may not know, and this hasn't really been widely reported, is that in December, Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar was tired of being told that he was a criminal, so he succeeded from AQIM, and he started his own group. And that's the group you keep hearing about, you know, Brothers in Blood or Signed in Blood, the group that apparently did this BP uh, attack. And the way they funded that attack was through all the smuggling and all these kidnappings. And the way they got the guns and weapons for the attack is when Libya fell, there was an arms bazaar in Africa. And uh, as a good indication, now these numbers aren't quite right, but the ratios are correct. In AK-47, before the fall of, um, of Libya and Muammar Gaddafi, an AK-47 cost about $100 in Africa. After the fall of Libya, it cost $50. So this is, uh, I was talking to an economics professor today, and I thought it was really cool how economics works everywhere, including the black market. So you, the way you could tell that guns were actually flooding the market was that the price of an AK-47 was cut in half. So what does uh, Mukhtar, Bel Mukhtar do with all his money from the kidnapping? He buys everything he can from Libya, including surface-to-air missiles. One of the reasons why there was such a big CIA presence in Benghazi, remember they sort of tried not to talk about that annex uh, that was about a mile away that was part of the second attack. The reason why they don't like to talk about it is because there are lots and lots of CIA contractors right now whose only job is to try and chase surface-to-air missiles. Uh, the guy in Pakistan who uh, shot those two Pakistani guys who apparently tried to rob him, Davies his last name was, or Davis, um, he was actually a contractor looking for surface-to-air missiles. So this is sort of this, when you hear about CIA people who are suddenly caught in places you don't expect them to be, uh, you might think for a second or two whether or not the reason why they're there is they're looking for surface-to-air missiles. So Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar bought all these arms, and we heard from Hillary Clinton last week that, in fact, the arms that were used in the BP attack were from Libya. So this is this confluence, right, of transnational crime, right, across the Sahel that is now marrying itself up with terrorism. And if you look at other al-Qaeda affiliates, that's happening with them, too. So in Somalia, they're laundering money. In uh, al-Qaeda's arm in Iraq, which is resurging with the withdrawal of U.S. troops, it's uh, using um, uh, extortion, and uh, AQIM's kidnapping, and AQAP is also shaking down people in Yemen for money. So before, Al-Qaeda used to be too ideologically pure to do these sorts of things, right? They were the black sheep, now they're leading the charge on transnational crime and terrorism. There's good news and bad news on this. And you may have heard this piece I did last week for NPR on this. The, the, the bad news first, is that this means that there is going to be a new channel of money, a new pipeline of cash into Al-Qaeda to help it fund its operations. The good news is the United States is incredibly good at breaking up criminal syndicates. It's not very good at breaking up ideological uh, groups. I mean, they've, they've basically killed their way to killing Al-Qaeda. They have not countered their narrative very effectively. But if Al-Qaeda marries itself with crime syndicates, that might provide an opening for the way in tighter budgets, the U.S. can go ahead and, and fight al-Qaeda. So they won't need necessarily drones. They'll need really smart people at the U.S. Treasury Department sort of turning the spigot off. And I think what you're going to see, not only in the coverage at NPR, but I think generally, you're going to see this intersection come up more and more and more. And this is going to be, I mean, some people call the affiliates al-Qaeda 2.0. I, I don't love those analogies that much, but this would be, if I loved that analogy, like al-Qaeda 3.0. And then the last thing I wanted to discuss just briefly um, has to do with the Arab Spring. And I was at an event for um, New Hampshire Public Radio. No, 
Maine Public Radio just recently, and uh, George Mitchell was there. And Senator George Mitchell, um, who, if I wanted somebody to negotiate me out of a war, it would be him. He just like exudes niceness out of his pores. He's just a, a really nice man. And I was doing this, this uh, sort of donor event with Quill Lawrence, who covers veterans for us. He was in Iraq for us. He was in Afghanistan for us. And Quill was talking about expectation. And Quill said that uh, he found that, or what he was really looking at when it came to veterans, was what is going to happen when the United States and, and the citizens really begin to assess the two wars, uh, the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. Because we haven't really assessed it and thought about it yet. Right? And like, were they wars worth fighting? We're still pulling people out of there. I don't think that we've really, as a nation, mulled that over, or even had enough time to mull it over and decide whether what we did there has ended up giving us what we wanted. Um, so Quill is sort of watching that, and the expectation that these troops are having, and I'm not saying we're going to be negative about troops. I don't think this is going to be another, like, Vietnam, coming back from Vietnam thing. But um, they had spent four and five tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, and how are they going to feel if the Amer American public sort of says, gee, I wonder why we did that? So that expectation is something that, that, that Quill is looking at. Um, with regard to the Arab uh, Spring, the expectation that I'm looking at was when the Arab Spring first happened, you remember everybody was saying Al-Qaeda is dead. It's over, right? Because Mubarak has fallen, all these dictators have fallen. And for the most part, these were fairly peaceful demonstrations. They weren't perfect, but they were fairly peaceful demonstrations. And Al-Qaeda's whole narrative has always been that the only way to topple these dictators and to beat the infidels is through incredible violence. And this, with the exception of Syria, I put that aside. But if you think of Tunisia, if you think of Yemen even, uh, there's not the same sort of violence that al-Qaeda would have uh, advocated. Um, but what we maintained as a news organization, even during the Arab Spring, the, or now the Arab Uprising, which is probably a better term for it, because there's not much spring-like about it anymore, is... Um, that those expectations that people had going in the streets, if those expectations weren't met, it was going to be a huge boon for Al-Qaeda. And a huge boon because there's nothing worse than being disillusioned. If you're disillusioned, someone can sell you uh, a different idea fairly easily because the idea that you had embraced disappointed you. And I think that is something that when we look at the Arab uprisings and we look at Al-Qaeda's role in the Arab uprisings, I think it's really important that we look at that aspect of it because that's where Al-Qaeda is going to get a toehold. So I told you about uh, George Mitchell for a very specific reason, and that was after Quill had said his piece and I had talked about the Arab Spring in expectation, George Mitchell then piped up and he said, you know, a really huge issue for me when I have been negotiating has been the expectation that people have for the United States. They think that because the United States is so powerful that when the U.S. doesn't go in and do something, it's not because it can't or because it won't be effective, it's because the U.S. doesn't want to. So they see it as really this idea that we don't care about you. And this has been a huge issue for him in his negotiations. Now, even today, you know, when I talk to, to Muslims about Bosnia, I was a White House correspondent during the Clinton administration. I worked for Bloomberg News at the time. And so I was there when they were making all the decisions on whether or not to go into Bosnia. And it took a long time to finally have the US go into Bosnia. And when it did, um, you know, we, a lot of the fighting stopped and things sort of cleaned themselves up and Richard Holbrook went in there and it, it worked out fairly well, people would say, I think. But if you talk to Muslims about it, all they remember is not that the U.S. went in and things got better. All they remember is how long it took the U.S. to go in. And they saw this as a definitive choice. And um, that goes into this whole idea of expectation. And I think that's going to be a, a, a theme that we're going to have to look at, not just with the Arab Spring, not just with terrorism, not just with veterans, but as a sort of basic policy. So this gets us back to this whole idea about budgets, right? And um, Zero Dark Thirty is not a movie I love. I don't know how many people have seen it. But uh, one of the, the scenes in Zero Dark Thirty, and I won't ruin it for you, although Osama bin Laden does die in the end, um, one of the scenes is uh, this woman is trying to get funding, right, 
this woman, Maya, is trying to get funding to follow around this guy that she thinks is the courier who will lead to Osama bin Laden. Okay? Absolute fiction. She had no, the, the bin Laden unit had absolutely no trouble getting funding because it was billions and billions and billions of dollars. They could not spend counterterrorism money fast enough at that time. We are no longer in that era, and we haven't been in that era for a really long time. So when you talk about budget cuts, and I'm not an expert on defense. Our, our uh, Pentagon correspondent, um, Tom Bowman, is better to talk about the sequester and that sort of thing. But when you talk about budgets and counterterrorism, um, counterterrorism has changed so much that these billions and billions of dollars are no longer needed. Example, the BP uh, facility, right? The BP attack has really woken up uh, Americans to the fact that North Africa is clearly an al-Qaeda problem, right? And that was the first time I think Americans really focused on that. We did a story back in October 2011 in which I said in this story that Africa was going to be the next big problem with al-Qaeda. The reason why I remember this, not only because it seems like I'm a genius now for writing that story back in 2011, um, is because my editor really pushed back and said, that's just such a vague, lumpy story. Africa's a really big place. And I said, I'm telling you, the people I'm talking to in the intelligence community, what they are worried about now, so this is October 2011, what they are worried about now is what al-Qaeda is going to do in Africa in the fissures that are there, whether it's Nigeria, and there's a group there called Boko Haram, or whether it's Mali or uh, any other place within you know, the Sahel. So we wrote that story, and then now, of course, we seem prescient. And of course, I wouldn't mention the story if the BP attack hadn't happened. You would never know that I wrote a story in 2011. But the, 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 BB, the reason why the BP attack is so illustrative here is because um, as soon as it happened, the U.S. began negotiating a SOFA agreement, a status of forces agreement, with uh, Niger. And they talked to Niger about um, putting in an airstrip so they can have a drone base there. So the way they are going to watch North Africa is not by putting boots on the ground, not necessarily by having special operations forces, though I'm sure they're going to be there too. The way they're going to do it is really a pretty cheap way. They're going to send drones in there to keep an eye on what's happening. Now, to begin with, the drones are supposed to be uh, unarmed, but I think that they're going to end up being armed if this threat this transnational uh, crime and terrorism threat continues to come out of Africa. And I think that's what you're going to see next, too. So just to sort of sum up, and then uh, we'll, we'll have a question and answer. Um, in this time of budgetary constraints, in a huge way, I'm not that concerned that uh, counterterrorism is going to suffer. It's pretty hard to cut counterterrorism programs because of the way the American people feel about them. And they have worked reasonably well, given that we have not had a major attack in the United States since 9-11. The biggest attack was Fort Hood. And um, just quickly, I uh, was in Pakistan right for five weeks, and I got back about three and a half weeks ago. And I've flown three times since then. And I don't know if you've ever looked at your boarding pass to see how you're coded, but I am now coded as a 4S. What a 4S means is, I've actually been in Pakistan, so they will rip apart my bag every single time I go through. And not just a little. I mean, she was leafing through my magazines. I was, I was getting a little angry about the leafing through the magazines. I mean, what were you looking for? Some, you know, evil Quranic verse that you wouldn't be able to read. And also, I have all these cards on my bags on purpose that say NPR in really big letters, because I carry a lot of radio equipment that could look suspicious. But if you see an NPR card, maybe that would explain it for you. And my actual title is counterterrorism correspondent. So it's rather silly as they're ripping up my bags. And I've mentioned this to them. But there was a guy who actually missed me and if I, on the way here. And I gave him my, my boarding pass, and I almost said to him, the last guy who tore apart my bag was kind of a jerk. Could you find a nice guy this time? And then I decided not to do it. I thought, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe the four S's don't mean what I think they do. And then he waves me through. And I went, oh my god, I was totally wrong about the four S's. I'm sitting with a cup of coffee. A guard comes to me about 25 minutes later and says, excuse me, miss, we need to check your bags. <laughs> so. Um, we walk over there, they tear apart my bags, and the supervisor says to me, who let you through? Who let you through? And I said, well, it was a guy with sort of a cheesy mustache and round glasses. And she said, what time did you go through? Meanwhile, they're 
pulling apart my bag and I'm being like really helpful. Uh, 916, 917, I just looked at my watch. I was wearing a black coat. I went through that one. No, and they're running through the videotape to try and find me. And uh, the guy walks up and I said, that's the guy. And uh, they show him my pass and he goes, holy shit. <laughs> Sorry. So, and meanwhile, I'm like this blonde-haired, blue-eyed counterterrorism correspondent that they're so frightened of. So they are basically going to be pulling apart my bags for some time to come. And uh, I know John Pistol, the head of TSA. I've had dinner with him, so I keep meaning to call him, and then I forget. So I'm definitely going to call him and say, really, could you take me off this list? And we'll see, see if it happens. So next time you get your boarding pass, look and see if you two are part of the 4S club. And, and uh, we can commiserate together. So maybe we can go to, to questions now. Thank you. <laughs>